I forgot to bring the oxygen, please help! Ah, Metroid. I feel like, despite being decently known in the overall gaming landscape, it's one of those more niche franchises from Nintendo. Mind you, niche doesn't mean it's bad in the slightest, just that a lot of people may not have experienced it on their own. Hey, look at that, what a strange coincidence. Of all the series that Nintendo owns, from Mario all the way to ARMS, Metroid is somehow one of the ones that I have the least amount of experience in. When it comes to putting myself into the boots of Miss Metroid herself, it's no exaggeration to say that I've got almost zero experience with her missions. No joke, the only experience I've had with the Orange Obliterator here is a small demo for Prime Hunters on the DS and like a few hours of Metroid Prime 3 at the most. If you ask me any boss or any power-up from any of these games, I will give you the most vacant glazed over stare. All I really know is that Metroid shoot very good with her arm, she rolls up into a ball like Sonic, and yes that is the Sonic quota filled if you're keeping track, and that Ridley was just a little too chunky to fit in Smash for a while. Oh, and uh, there's this giant brain that sounds like this. Yeah, thanks niche micro-celebrities on the internet for introducing me to Captain N. The only major series I have less exposure to would probably be Fire Emblem and the Mother series. Even then, it's not that far of a margin. One demo and a few hours in the last game of a trilogy aren't exactly high marks. To me, Samus was just a character from Smash that I didn't know much about. She occupied the same space as Captain Falcon, a character who clearly has legacy and fans that adore them, but did stand on the same pedestal as the plumber and the elf. But I've always had some interest in this series where I thought it looked really cool. Most of my exposure to it comes from speedruns of Super Metroid, but I wouldn't say that's a fair look at the whole game. Seeing people demolish any game in under an hour gives you a completely different vibe than playing it for yourself, you know? For what it's worth, I do have a little bit of experience in the genre that it helped form, the Metroidvania being the Vania part of Metroidvania, of course. I think that's the worst joke I've ever written. God, why does anyone let me write these videos? Games like Dust in Elysian Tale or Ori in the Blind Forest have elements that go as far back as Metroid or even Castlevania. And it's really cemented this idea that I love the Metroidvania genre, even if I don't have a lot of experience with it. If I only had one type of game that I could have on a deserted island, it would probably be a Metroidvania of some sort. I was gonna make a joke about being stranded with all the different Sonic games that there are, but then I remembered 3D Blast exists, and reality is sometimes much funnier than a joke. There's another part to this that I've kind of started to realize about myself that I didn't really notice until recently. Of all the settings that exist in video games, or even just fiction, I go back and forth between loving space and futuristic settings and fantastical, well, fantasy stories. I started to realize it a few years ago doing a playthrough of both the Mass Effect and Dragon Age series nearly back to back. While my love of swords was on full display back in the Zelda video, I can easily get sucked into a spacefaring adventure that spans multiple planets, with aliens and cultures unique to each one. While not all of the recent offerings appeal to me, I still do love Star Wars and Star Trek. Destiny is one of my favorite games out there, even if it's sometimes... Destiny, if you know, you know. Beefy. Which is funny, because I do think I have an acute fear of space in some way. I'm that kid that in the middle of science class in like 8th grade, when your teacher tells you in like 3 quadrillion years the earth is going to explode because of the sun, I was having a panic attack in the back of the room. As fascinating as space is, it is so intensely horrifying to just me, probably. The uncertainty and unknowable nature of it, with how many questions are out there, just shakes me to my very core. I'm the only person out there that could watch Cosmos with Carl Sagan and take it as a horror story when he starts talking about the pale blue dot. Carl, I love you. You could talk about the riveting concept of paint drawing and I could be hung on every single word. But the more you talk about how little we know about space, the more it just freaks me the fuck out. I, I need you to chill, man. Back on topic, I think it's that fear of the unknown and exploring its depths that makes a Metroidvania concept work. From how it's been described to me, Metroid works at making you feel isolated and alone in a hostile, foreign world. 
Not that it makes you feel helpless, even if a survival horror Metroid sounds interesting, but everything presented there is to make you feel that crushing, weighty loneliness. And from what I remember of other Metroidvania games that I've played, that early feeling of isolation only adds to that later catharsis when you're beefed up by a ton of upgrades. New methods of traversal, new attacks that made previously frustrating enemies melt when you look at them. When it comes to this feeling of a tangible creep of player power, I don't think any genre does it better than this. Since I've been making these little journals looking back at older games that passed me by, I thought it would be a good idea to step out of my comfort zone and try a series I really have no experience with. I've always wanted to try the Metroid series, Super most of all, because I've always really had an endearing thought towards the Metroidvania genre. Quick rundown of how this is going to go for anyone that might be new here. Um, I'm going to play these games one by one and stop in between each one. So. I'll be writing up the section about Metroid 1 and I won't have played 2 or Super just yet for any other context. Make sense? I know Samus' missions aren't always the easiest, but I've never been one to shy away from a challenge. I beat Zelda 2 and you know what? There is nothing that this world can throw at me that I'm not ready for. Let's do this. Fuck. Fuck, I forgot the oxygen again. Please. Have a heart. Consider subscribing to save an idiot who didn't bring his oxygen. Each subscription will fill his ego so that he can store more oxygen in his giant head. I have a confession to make. Years ago, I heard a streamer called Metroid Meat Rod, and ever since then, no matter how many times I see the name or hear the title, I have intrusive thoughts. I can't see this title as anything other than Meat Rod. Welcome to I've Never Played Meat Rod. Where to even start? I said it in the intro, but I think Metroid as a series is well known, but at the same time, I don't know if it's well played. And I don't mean that in a bad way or that it's indicative of the quality of the games, not at all. But when I think of the series that Nintendo promotes, it doesn't feel like it's on the same level. Like, at the top of the list, you got your A-listers like Mario, Zelda, Pikachu, Kirby, all those. Then you go one level down, that's where you see Metroid and Wario. Series that have a decent amount of games and a good amount of fans, but aren't going to break the bank for Nintendo anytime soon. It's not going to become the most profitable media franchise in history like a certain yellow rat. I feel like there's an inherent barrier of entry when it comes to Metroid, and I'm not sure why. In comparison to your Marios and your Zeldas, the vibes for Samus' stories are always just a little bit different. Part of me wants to say, oh, it's more mature, but I don't necessarily mean that Mario or Zelda is only for babies. I mean, maybe a little bit on the Mario angle. But the overall concept of Metroid feels like it's hitting a different target audience than Nintendo's flagships. Like there's Mario going on his big whimsical adventure to save the princess, jumping over pits, running through colorful worlds, it's all just a great time. Or then you get Zelda games where you're just a little elf child going through the world with your sword, fighting enemies so much larger than you. It's a little more dire, but you know, it's still colorful, it's still whimsical, it's still Nintendo. Meanwhile, you've got Metroid. Uh, you're a bounty hunter. Um, your objective is uh, kill. Your abilities are kill. Go kill. I know the game is still all silly 8-bit graphics and Samus looks like a stand-in for E.T. in this game, but there's something so much more visceral about shooting an enemy and watching their sprite just explode when you kill them. Like, it still looks like a game you'd find on your TI-80 graphing calculator, but I don't know, there's something about it that just sets it apart from other Nintendo games around this time. From the top down, Metroid establishes itself as something cut from a different cloth than Nintendo's other offerings. The title sets the tone right out the gate, that mysterious, foreboding music over a darker, cooler colored title screen. There's so much here just from the starting menu that establishes how different the mission is. You're not in some magical lands, you're not jumping over silly turtles and mushrooms everywhere. You're infiltrating a base of space pirates here to shut down their operations and find the Metroids inside, and if anything gets between you and your objective, you don't just jump on them, you don't just stab or slash at them, you blast them away. Nintendo, making a hero with a gun? Someone call Ronald Reagan, he has to see what this, this, this game is teaching our kids. Infiltrating bases, killing enemies, they're gonna put the military recruiters out of business. Only the government can tell kids that it's fun to kill. Honestly, I started considering what games to do an I've Never video on next while I was doing the Zelda video. 
Metroid was the front runner, and then Donkey Kong Country was like right behind it. But much like my nightmares in the last few months, Zelda 2 threw a wrench in those plans. I was worried after how much I didn't like Zelda 2 that this would end up being a repeat of that experience. Some of the comments on the Zelda video had some of the same thoughts, thinking I probably wouldn't enjoy Metroid after all that pain. So what did I think overall? Was it as soul-crushing as Zelda 2? Do I have to go full AVGN and get pissed off at this game? Is my evil doppelganger gonna come out of the shadows and force me to finish playing this game for punishment of something or another? As fun as going back to the early days of online reviewing would be, I don't think we have to go that crazy with it. In short, I liked it. Alright, let's move on to Metroid 2. I think most of my fears of this being anything like Zelda 2 went out the window when I started getting a feel for the gameplay. You can tell that there was an understanding of what they wanted Metroid to be. While Metroid 1 came out a little bit before Zelda 2, to say it feels like a marriage between Mario and Zelda isn't an unfair comparison, I don't think. There's elements from both series that feel like a natural marriage without sacrificing its own ideas. Exploration and combat blends together better than Link's second outing, focusing more on a full 2D world for the player to scrounge through. I said it when talking about Zelda 1, but it really is impressive how seamless and expansive this game feels while you explore. It's easy to get lost in rooms while exploring, seeing what's behind each new door that you hadn't seen before. While there are only so many places you can go before you need upgrades, there's still so much you can find early on. From the start of the game, it gives you two directions you can search, and to all the Metroid veterans out there, I'm sure you know which way you're supposed to go first to progress. Can you guess which way I went first? Now, in my defense, most platformers have taught me going to the right is the way to go and ignoring every other direction. That's my story and I'm sticking to it, so you can't make fun of me in the comments. My ego just couldn't take it, please. Of course I'm gonna go the wrong way and hit the tunnel that I need the morph ball for. I had a 50-50 shot of getting a power up just by starting the game. You know I'm gonna get that shit wrong. When I went the wrong way and ended up at the tunnel I needed the morph ball for, I was faced with a question that has plagued scholars since the beginning of time. Why can't Metroid crawl? Metroid establishes very early if you fail that 50-50 that there are areas that you can't go without certain power ups. In this instance, it's a very concentrated lesson that doesn't have much roadblocking involved. You can't progress until you get the morph ball, and everything between getting the ball and progressing to the next section is basically a mini tutorial. The enemies on the path are basic enough that it gives you a challenge while letting you get a handle on your controls, and honestly, I was surprised at how simple the overall controls felt. I guess I was always so used to seeing people speedrun Super Metroid or seeing all the gadgets you would get in later Prime games. For this first outing, it makes sense how basic the framework is, for better or for worse. You run, you jump, you shoot, you ball. Your gameplay doesn't deviate away from these skills as you progress, they're the base skills you'll be using through the whole game. Instead, much like Zelda, you gain new power-ups through your exploration that helps you jump and ball in new zones. When it comes to the power-ups in Metroid 1, I don't think that there's a single wasted slot when it comes to usefulness. Every single one of them makes Metroid feel even stronger, and just adds to how cool of a protagonist he really is. What do you mean his name isn't Metroid? What, what do you mean he isn't a he? What do you mean I did this joke in the Zelda video and that repeated bits aren't funny? I think that each power-up changes Samus' toolkit in just enough ways that it makes you excited to see each one. When you walk into a room and see this fried chicken man just sitting here, you know you're about to get something that helps you slaughter even faster. While Samus' arsenal isn't as robust as something like Link's, the sheer usefulness of each power-up makes up for that. Like, the Morph Ball isn't just for getting through tight spaces even if that's the initial use to the player. When you eventually get the bomb upgrade, it suddenly becomes an extremely useful tool against targets that are close to the ground. The beam upgrades are extremely powerful too, in different ways. The ice beam is great when you first get it, it helps take out the faster moving enemies. Even though most every enemy in the game has a pattern that you can avoid, the ice beam helps you deal with them just a little bit easier. Freezing an enemy sets them up perfectly for a missile attack, and it's one of the most satisfying combos in the game. Locking an enemy in place and making them contemplate their last moments as a missile is stuffed in their mouth, mwah, can't get enough. Then eventually you get the big wobble wave and everything is just fucking dead. It deals so much damage, has a wide arc, and combined with the long beam upgrade you can just take out entire rooms without worrying about obstacles. While it's a shame that it overrides the ice beam, I think it's just a better weapon. Why would you want to freeze an enemy when you can just nuke them to death? I mean, there's no option to switch between beams here. The wave beam just overrides the ice beam. Clearly, we'll be able to ride out the rest of the game with the wave beam and have no problems whatsoever.
Even the upgrades to the basic jump feel really, really good. When you get your moon shoes and you're able to just hop across longer rooms or jump back up through shortcuts that drop you to the floor, it feels really nice. Meanwhile, the screw attack is like so iconic, I didn't realize it came this early into the series. I thought it was like an addition in Super or something. It is so powerful being able to just run and jump and destroy pretty much every single enemy because I think it has the same strength as a missile. It is beautiful. Of the three series I've played for these videos, I think I've enjoyed Metroid's first outing the most so far. When I was just testing footage recording, just running around in the starting area, there was a level of joy that didn't hit quite as hard as the other two. The tightness to Samus's controls feel great, running back and forth while you're lost still feels like a pretty good time. And with each ability you get, it just builds on top of itself in a way I hadn't expected. Learning how to get through each room, encountering new enemies and discovering their patterns, even finding secrets and shortcuts all felt fantastic. While Metroid 1 isn't as intuitive when it comes to its secret placements, it still feels good finding a hidden wall or path just to move ahead. It's to the point where, even late into the game, after beating the Ridley boss, I didn't mind running back to the entrance because I loved just stomping around. Though, there are a few caveats that I'm still not wholly sure how I feel about. I had a similar issue with Zelda 1, and I think playing through this game I came to the same conclusion. This game needs a fucking map. And what I ended up wrestling with was how much would a map ruin the experience for me. I didn't want to just look up something that told me everywhere I needed to go at every single instance because that would trivialize the exploration and discovery of the game. And I don't want to just make it a simple walk through the world, you know? Then again, I didn't realize I needed to use five missiles to open up the red doors for like an hour and I just ran around lost. So. Maybe I'm not the best person to say what is and isn't needed in this game. But hey, you know what? Neat touch that the red doors light up when you switch to the missile. It's nice that that gives the player the idea of what you need to use here. I don't think it's the same issue as Zelda, since a lot of the exploration problems could technically be solved by drawing out a map. You could map out all of Zelda 1's world if you took the time and effort. But I think that's because, in large part, Zelda's overworld map design is a lot simpler. While there were secrets you could find hidden in the sprites of the world, each tile you found was a unique location with mostly identifiable landmarks. And at the same time, you had a little box at the top where, even if it wasn't detailed, it still gave you enough to know which part of the world you were in. Now, when it comes to Metroid, there's no difference when it comes to Overworld or Dungeon, really. While there are specific locations for Kraid, Ridley, and Mother Brain that serve as their hideouts, you don't have optional objectives or maps like Zelda. Because of that, all of Metroid becomes a complicated tangle of maze-like hallways and clustered rooms of enemies. Now, overall I don't think that this is a problem. One of my all-time favorite Stockholm Syndrome series is Sonic, and most of the 2D games look like ant farms if you zoom out their map too far. But the difference is, all these different paths aren't necessary. They're not mandatory for progression, they're just different ways that you can go depending on how well you play the game. You don't have to map out every single path because they all lead to the same endpoint in the Sonic game. But when you start making hidden paths and all these winding roads necessary to get to the end of the game, I started to question what would and wouldn't be trivialized here. But then... Then I hit my breaking point the longer I looked at the level design. I was never the same after the Metroid incident. The first time I noticed an issue was in the first major vertical tunnel in Brinstar, starting to climb up and up when I started the game. There was a point when I noticed the platform and tile placements were repeating the more I climbed. And you know, Mario and Zelda had similar mechanics where you had to find a different way forward otherwise the path would just keep looping. So I ignored it and I moved on to a different wing of the game. But then... I started to notice rooms that would repeat entire layouts, enemy placements, some back to back when you would walk in from one room to another. Something inside me started to sink where I realized how difficult it would be to map out this game in any meaningful, not mind melting sort of way. When you have multiple repeating rooms in a rapid succession in some cases, it makes exploration feel less rewarding and more of just a chore to progress. Being unfamiliar with the game and trying to get a handle on where you need to go, it's really difficult to get your bearings sometimes. But then when you get through a particularly difficult room and then the next one after it is just a carbon copy of the same one, it really starts to grind your gears just a little too much. Oh, I barely got through that room with like five health and a few missiles. All right, let's see what this next one is. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. 
Now, I'm not about to say that repeating rooms or assets or anything like that is lazy or bad. Far from it, especially with a game like this on significantly lower powered hardware than they'd have in just a few years. The sheer size of Metroid's world, while smaller when you see it all laid out, still feels massive and expansive. And in some ways, I don't mind the repeated rooms because it adds to the confusing atmosphere. It makes total sense that, on a foreign planet, you wouldn't know how to get around. And if it was a base for space pirates, they would likely do everything they could to make it difficult for intruders to get in and out. But while I can technically justify the reasons for why the design exists, it doesn't necessarily make it good. That was the struggle I found getting through it, and questioning whether a visual aid would remove the struggle. After I found a few energy tank upgrades and the Varia suit, combat really didn't become that much of a hassle. So if combat wasn't where the difficulty came from, would getting a map just trivialize the entire game? And of course, I went to the one place everyone goes when they have a question they need answers to. A place where people can guide you on your path through life and keep you on the straight and narrow. Reddit. I joke, but I eventually cracked and I found a map just because I felt like I wasn't making progress anymore. I did the same thing with Zelda 1 and even in my research I found like a couple of maps directly from Nintendo Power. So even if they're making the maps like, all is fair, right? I think I struck a good balance between using the map to find my way around and using it as a crutch. Even though I still had to pilot- I can't believe I have to say this. Even though I still had to pilot Samus through random floor sphincters, I didn't want to make it so that I wasn't still exploring. Did it take away some of the challenge of routing my way through the game and figuring out where to go? Yes, a little, and I'm sure if I really, really wanted to spend my time making a map on graph paper like old times, I could have. But if I had to make the decision between looking up a pre-made map or slowing my playthrough down to a halt to roleplay a cartographer, I think I'd make the same decision every time. Feel free to comment that I not only cheated the game, but also myself. It'd genuinely make me crack up, like please go do that down there, I mean it. But enough about my insecure feelings about a 40 year old game, let's talk about some bosses because I'm pretty sure I brute forced my way through all three of them. Each boss fight really boils down to how many projectiles can the NES handle before it decides to go supernova. Like, there are so many bullets that the bosses shoot at you that the amount of slowdown there is just, it's hard to describe without showing it. Like, going into the Ridley boss fight, the game basically just shits itself. I do appreciate that each boss has their own base to get through before you can even take them on. It really adds to the idea that this is a base of a bunch of notorious pirates. Having a little labyrinth build up before you come face to face with an alien monster makes finding them more relieving and stressful. Though the issue with repeating rooms and identical layouts is probably at its worst inside the base sections. Each has branching paths that you can explore with multiple copies of the main room down each of the corridors. And while, again, it disorients the player and keeps them on their toes, after seeing this room with the balls for like the third time in Ridley's base, I started to believe in cruel and unusual destruction. Also, Ridley's base feels like it was made by like the Joker with all these hidden pits and traps and shit. Like, fuck off, dude. You're a giant lizard. Stop playing games with me. Like I said, each boss fight just kind of turns into a hail of projectiles from both sides, and eventually the slowdown becomes so bad the game almost like crawls to a halt. I almost feel bad about complaining about slowdown in Mario 3 because in comparison, that game basically ran at 120 frames. Like, it is night and day to comparing how badly this game runs. Ridley is by far the worst of all three bosses. Like, there is so much slowdown, it's almost impossible to get into a proper position for damage. You'll be stuck midair for a few extra frames, and like, it's hard to dodge the attacks if you're not already jumping. I had to check if my emulator was like running on slow a few times because it felt like I was the one fucking something up. That's how bad it got. Technical issues aside, I don't think that any of the bosses are all that impressive, especially when you have a decent amount of energy tanks in the Varia suit. For Kraid, I just face tanked every attack he put out since the slowdown made his pattern too difficult to properly avoid. Since I had so much health in reserve, I got in close and spammed him with missiles and it was over in seconds. And Ridley is just kind of a dick. Like his fight has so much damn slowdown that it's impossible to plan ahead. Or I guess it has too much time to plan, to the point where it feels like you're stuck in DBZ time. 20 minutes for Goku to land a single punch on Frieza, roll to credits, good job everyone. I did mostly the same tactic as Kraid with a bit more positioning involved in nuking him down with the missiles. Remember kids, when in doubt, reduce your enemies to ash with missiles. We call that the Obama specialty. 
It's not gonna- it's not gonna get me, like, removed from YouTube or anything. I'm not gonna get hunted down by the FBI, am I? But with how easy the bosses have been at this point, I really shouldn't have that much problems with, uh, Mother Brain, right? Like, I have almost all the missiles that I can carry, I have as many energy tanks as I can hold. Surely this is just gonna be like the other ones, I'll just blast right through it and get to the very end with no problem. Now... I know that the Ice Beam isn't necessary. I know that because I looked it up, because I had to know why Nintendo would do this. I understand it was probably a limitation of the NES and they probably couldn't figure out a way to properly change the different beans at will. But at the same time, I just got gang sucked to death by a bunch of space jellyfish and lost all of my health reserves. I deserve to be a little bit of a salt factory for just a second. Part of me was like, you know, hopeful that when I got the wave beam I would be set with that power up. But there was something sort of a red flag when I found the second Ice Beam power-up in Norfair. Something that just kind of clicked in the back of my mind. Like, why would they have a second one of these here? Why would, why would I be able to pick it up again if I already had the Ice Beam? After I ran my happy ass all the way back to the Ice Beam and all the way back to Mother Brain's base, I killed every fucking Metroid. And you know what? I was close to full health and basically had all of my missiles. Vindicated, continuing to learn that slaughter is good. Thank you, Nintendo. Do you see these little things? You see these little fucking Cheerios just floating around at random? Do you know how much pain these little fucking things caused me? Do you know how much I sacrificed thanks to these damn rings of death? The Mother Brain boss isn't very complex. There's a lot of moving parts, and by moving parts I mean bullets. Bullets and these SpaghettiOs just trying to shove their way down my esophagus. Ooh. And it was here where I started to really dislike the way that the game was designed. I understand that shooting bullet patterns was probably easier than making like complex enemy attack animations, but whoo boy, it started to get really frustrating. But watching these danger donuts just appear above and below me with zero time to react while I'm trying to get the smallest amount of damage kind of felt shit. Like it didn't ruin my perception of the game. I died a few times on this boss, but Every time I had to run back to the start of this fight and constantly just spam the missile to destroy all these tubes, I can't help but feel like I was really wanting to kill the brain at this point. Like, not even just as like a game, I wanted to come into the game and destroy the brain myself. With Mother Brain dead, the escape sequence began with a very silly climbing sequence of repeated platform placements. I didn't get the feeling that I was escaping from an exploding base, I felt like I was escaping from that jar that Dr. Mario uses. But once at the top, Samus asserts her dominance and stares directly at the player. Her armor starts to fade away and reveals... Oh fuck, it was Carrot Top all along. How did he sneak his way in here? Metroid 1 of the three I've never videos that I've done so far is my favorite first game in each of these series. Something about the way you just run and gun and you run around this planet just really tickled the neurons in the perfect way. The exploration, all the character growth, I just, I could not get enough of playing this. It was just so fun to experience. I think with just a little bit of quality of life and polish on a lot of the main systems, Metroid 1 could be an amazing game. Simple, but it doesn't really need to be much more than it already is. The story is simple, but it's effective, leading to a gameplay loop that I really, really enjoyed. But I wasn't satisfied in just thinking these opinions were correct. I needed to dig a little bit deeper. I needed harder evidence that Samus's first mission could be something incredible. And for that, I had to look to Nintendo themselves for the answer. Right off the bat, I'm gonna say this. I didn't complete Zero Mission, but God, let me tell you how hard it was to stop. Almost immediately after finishing Metroid 1, I wanted to compare it to what Nintendo's attempt at a remake would feel like. I wanted to see if some of my own thoughts about what needed to change or improve the game ended up showing in a pseudo-redo of Samus's first mission. I told myself I would get to the boss fight with Kraid and then I would move on. That sounded like a fair comparison, just like the first third of the game. But then I think I tainted my opinion of Metroid 1 in retrospect. 
Honestly, that's like legitimately my fault. I just want to go deeper with Zero Mission and play the later games in the series. I fucked up real bad, guys. Now, I'm not gonna make a big revelation out of a remake of a 20-year-old game being better. In most cases, given the right love and care, that should go without saying. But I think playing Zero Mission so quickly after the original, while still not having many experiences with the series, felt like I was given forbidden knowledge. The presentation is top-notch, from the sprites to the world around you. It sells the atmosphere of being on an alien world far better than the original could have. Even just running around and using your weapons feels so much stronger than before. The sheer feeling of controlling Samus in Zero Mission is just addicting to the point where I didn't want to stop. But I think most of all was that my problems of feeling lost were almost entirely gone. It's hard to overstate how useful an optional map really is. It's no more detailed than like a Zelda dungeon map, and you don't really get the full map until you're about halfway through an area, give or take. It mixes blind exploration with the player getting gradually more and more familiar with the planet, but it does it in a way that doesn't trivialize your exploration and discovery overall. There are enough breadcrumbs that the game gives you thanks to the chicken wing men that you're led through the planet, but this little waypoint and the actual map are two different discoveries, giving you a general direction to search. It blends the lack of direction from Metroid 1 with the quality of life improvements that the games would see over two decades of innovation. Even then, while I always had a map at my fingertips, I felt more comfortable searching and finding my own way around. Even beyond that, secrets feel integrated into the world far more naturally and intuitively. I felt rewarded whenever I would find a secret that was hidden away, but the pieces were in place for me to find them. It still has the general vibes of Metroid 1, but with gameplay that better leans into the exploration and hunting that it asks of you. Even Kraid, the boss that I force-fed missiles to, it feels a lot better here. Everything has a better balance between its difficulty and its accessibility. And I'm not saying that Metroid or any game needs to be easier, but what I'm saying is the difficulty of Metroid shouldn't feel like you're drunkenly stumbling through the same room every second. I think it's important to note the changes here, understanding what Nintendo themselves thought was important to change and add to the original. Even in just the little bit I've played of Zero Mission around an hour and a half, I don't know if I could or would want to go back to Metroid 1. It feels like I would just have to take too many extra steps to get a similar but lesser experience. I still don't think that Metroid 1 is bad, but I think the extra research I've done in its remake has made me realize a lot more of the glaring flaws than I might have noticed without it. And I'm not saying I would never go back to the game, but I can only hope that the sequel would improve on some of the aspects I think needed some tuning. Oh fuck, that's right, it's on the Game Boy. I mean, we are just absolutely screwed. The return of Samus? Where'd she return from? Detroit? Ha! I've always had a strange connection to Metroid 2. I guess you could say it's a bit of a lie that I've never played this game, but it's like having Mario Bros. Deluxe as a kid too. I technically had Metroid 2 for my Game Boy, but playing it for the video, I don't remember a single bit of it. I don't think I really even got that far. Before we get too deep, a small disclaimer. While the footage you're seeing is of a repainted ROM hack, none of the actual gameplay or anything like that was changed. I gave the game a little bit of a facelift just to make it look better for the video so you didn't have to look at this the entire game. Fair? Alright, let's get back to the jokes. To me, the Game Boy was always just the Pokemon machine. Not that I finished Pokemon either, but you know, the thought that counts. If it didn't have creatures I forced into cage fights, I didn't want anything to do with it. I think I had this... Um, the Pokemon games, obviously, and like an NBA Jam game that I played from time to time, but that's all I really remember. Hi, uh, okay, look, I had to get the green screen back out while I was editing because I was doing some cleaning, and I found another uh, Game Boy game I had. Um, I have a Terminator 2 Game Boy game by LJN for some reason. I don't remember ever getting this game. I don't know where it came from. Why the fuck do I have this shit? What, who gave this to a kid? I think my bias using the Game Boy as a Pokemon box has tainted my perception of what the Game Boy can do. The idea of playing a Metroid game on the OG Game Boy sounded like it was going to be 
not bad. I never want to assume any game is bad before I play it, but difficult. As in, the game would be technically impressive, but the gameplay itself would feel dated, clunky, maybe even a little painful? Can you tell I grew up on the Game Boy Advance? But I shouldn't have been too harsh on the Game Boy, and I don't think I'll ever make that mistake again. You ever seen that Game Boy that's in that museum that, like, survived an explosion or something? That should have told me how good Metroid 2 was gonna be. I didn't hate Metroid 1 as much as I thought there were aspects to improve. Combat was fun, but a little spammy, and exploration ended up being a chore in an often tedious way. It was still fun to play, but playing Zero Mission for research poisoned how I feel about that game in retrospect. And while Metroid 2 has some similar issues, I think I genuinely enjoyed playing it more than the original. Weird as it is, I preferred the Game Boy sequel over the original. Might as well say I enjoy the original Chain of Memories over Kingdom Hearts 1 at this point. In as many ways as Metroid 2 feels like the same game that came before it, it does a lot to bring new ideas to the table that sets it apart. From the combat, to the exploration, to even just the general vibe, it feels like a refined version springing off of what made the first game so interesting. Oh god, I think I'm becoming a Metroid fan. At least they got something more recently than, like, Captain Falcon. I'm not letting myself play F-Zero 99 because I, I can't let myself feel. While I appreciate that Mario 2 and Zelda 2 tried something different and did everything they could to stand out from the original just a little bit, I think I appreciate Metroid 2 for the exact opposite reason. I really loved the gameplay in the first one, so having something more refined with these immaculate vibes, mwah, I couldn't ask for better. The first game had a basic premise. You're a bounty hunter and it's your job to take out a base full of space pirates and their very wrinkly leader, Mother Brain. But despite the game being called Metroid, you don't even interact with the title monster until like the final zone. They are one of the biggest threats in the game, especially after how hard they sucked the soul out of me, but they don't show up soon enough to leave that much of an impact. So the second game's whole premise is just to exterminate the remainder of the Metroid species. You know, a simple, fun little premise for kids. But as simple as it seems on the outside, the way the game frames the task is what makes it so powerful. The game does everything it can to twist and break your perception of the story. We'll get to the moral implications of wiping out an entire species in a little bit. Right now, we're talking about being a hero and definitely not a soldier of fortune. Samus controls almost exactly how she did in the first game, to the point where I barely needed to adjust. We may be on different hardware, but when it works, it works. Unless your name is Todd Howard. Can you imagine Metroid made by Bethesda? I want to hear Ridley speaking in that Nord accent from Skyrim so bad. Hey, you. Finally awake. Ah! From the start of the game, the atmosphere Metroid 2 presents is extremely well done. The title screen, while simple, is eerie and tense, a droning high-pitched sound echoing every couple of seconds. No triumphant soundtrack, nothing to get you pumped for the mission ahead. When I first heard it, I sat for a while waiting to see if this screen changed at all, but instead it just made me feel anxious the longer that I listened. But I'm sure it's just a stylistic choice. Once the game gets going, that adventure vibe really kicks in. The music is upbeat in its star-faring way, with Samus starting out on her ship and making her way into the caverns of SR-388. It gives you time to get accustomed to the controls again, with how the change in console might have changed the gameplay. Samus looks a lot more like the Samus we know today. Her suit looks like proper power armor now, once again defying what I keep thinking the Game Boy can do. When you get moving and start using her abilities, there's a surprising range of animation. Samus' run cycle this time is a powerful stride, and it's fast compared to Metroid 1's. And the jump feels really good too, it feels about as comparable as the high jump in Metroid 1. Is it placebo, since I know I get the high jump boots later? Yes. Does it still make me feel powerful thinking this way? Also yes, I need to have power fantasies in my video game, otherwise the crushing realization that most of this video was spent sitting in front of an editing software will slowly sink in. I am really on SR388 right now, killing all these Metroids with Samus, and you cannot prove that I am not. You search around aimlessly, getting an early feel for what Samus can do in the general flow of the game. Learning you can shoot downwards when jumping, how high Samus can jump, all good stuff like that. You probably wonder what your overall objective is, and you look to the bottom of your screen seeing your health, your missile count, and... Metroid count? Well, I mean, the Metroids weren't that bad to deal with back in Metroid 1. Get an ice beam somewhere, a few missiles, simple. That's a... 
whole lot of them this time around, but this is probably a quick in and out adventure, an hour or two tops. Oh god, they're nothing like Metroid 1. Put them back, put it back! The first time I saw the Metroid transformation, I was wholly unprepared. I knew the mission was about taking out Metroids. I knew most of the game was going to be destroying Metroids. I was not prepared for Geiger-esque body horror and mutations happening right in front of me. But goddamn is it really effective at setting the tone. You may be a capable and effective killing machine, killing about 10 or so Metroids in the first game. But they're evolving. They're getting stronger. No more Suckatron 5000. They're about to crack you open like a lobster and get to the soft, squishy bits underneath. I think it's here where Metroid 2 really changes and loops back around onto that eerie, uncomfortable title screen. The noises the Metroids make when you damage it isn't anger, it's genuine pain. While it may look monstrous to us, its actions, its sounds, it already started to feel a little... wrong. But maybe I'm just looking too much into it, that this was just the first one we found, and then we have 38 more to go at this point. Making your way to Area 1, that triumphant, adventurous music kicks in again, with the fresh destruction of that Alpha Metroid in the back of my mind. There's platforming to do and local fauna to destroy for health and missiles. No time to worry about my moral dilemmas, there's a mission to complete. Stepping into Area 1, the vibes completely change again. The music melts away into this droning, ambient track with the occasional chitter of wildlife animals and what I assume are Metroids in the background. It is haunting in some ways. The first time I heard the music drop out like that leaving me in the cavernous region of Area 1, I just had to soak it all in. I was so used to the almost constant music in Metroid 1 that this ambient droning felt foreign. This... This was the Metroid I was told about with the loneliness and almost fear at every turn. Of course, I would never be scared by a video game, I'm built different, so I just kept on with my mission. One thing I want to mention is the layout of most areas because I was shocked at how massive they felt. I think it's in part to the screen limitations of the Game Boy since I had some annoyances with how much, or how little, it offered to the player. There are times when it feels like Samus takes up like 20% of the screen, while the rest of the screen around her is massive or claustrophobic. I don't know how better to describe it. A lot of the areas early in the game have huge, cavernous designs with high ceilings on the outside and narrow, dense tunnels below. And I think each area is really fucking cool, I mean it. Most of my problems with the design of Metroid 1 were fixed, with almost every screen and room being mostly unique aside from a few instances early on. But because of the size of the Game Boy's screen and, by proxy, the resolution through emulation, it was easy to feel like you're never being shown enough. Rooms that feel tight with not enough screen space to show you what's ahead, or again, those massive ceilings surrounding the area maps that make it hard to get a bearing of how high or how far you are. I'm not saying that it impeded my fun, but it felt like a lot of the limitations of the Game Boy really made the game harder than it needed to be. Playing a character that relies on ranged tactics, the game incentivizes you to stay at range when you're attacking. But because of the screen, it's incredibly easy, especially when fighting Metroids, to accidentally scroll it just a little too far when you're trying to get out of range. And when you do that, it essentially despawns the enemy until you bring it back on screen. This can be beneficial if you're running low on supplies or you're about to die and lets you get away from the enemy safely. But more often than not, it forces you into closer range than you would probably feel comfortable doing just to get damage in. Like they don't even do the big suck anymore, I don't want to get anywhere near them. If they don't do the suck, then they're shit out of luck. The game falls into a loop though, not a bad one, but a loop all the same. Find a new area, hunt down all the power-ups and metroids that you can find, and move on. After the first two areas, I was worried that it would start to feel stale, being little more than just killing mini-bosses over and over. I think the best way I've heard Metroid 2 described before is that it feels like a chore. But being a chore doesn't mean it's bad or it's not engaging, and in most of my time playing it really felt like the opposite. Whenever you clear out an entire zone of Metroids, the caverns start to rumble, signaling that you're done in an area. Another pathway opens up in a previously dead-end area too, making this the signal that it's time to find your way to the new zone. And it's this little earthquake signal that really made something click for me around the midpoint of the game. 
Something I didn't expect that changed my view of Metroid 2. I don't remember which specific area it was. It might have been two or three, but I was just going through the zone, finding the Metroids and the power-ups. And after I'd finished killing one, I started to move on only for the earthquake to signal the end of the area. I wasn't even aware of how many Metroids I had killed. It felt like I had just gotten there when the earthquake started, but when I looked at the counter, I had killed almost 10 of them. I had gotten so used to the routine, so used to the chore that I was just killing without thinking how many I had left to kill. It fucked me up a little bit, realizing how numb I had gotten to the job that I was on. This is, this is just a job. I'm, there's no moral problems with this. Listen, the triumphant music just started again. It's time to go to the next part of the adventure. <laughs> I will say, in comparison to the upgrades in the first game, the ones you get here are all really damn cool. Most of them help with traversal, and considering how big these maps are, they're sorely needed. If I had to play this whole game with only the high jump boots again, I would have lost my damn mind. Instead, Nintendo gave the player a whole set of new toys to explore the depths of SR388. I think the spider ball and the spring ball are two of the best additions, because it makes figuring out morph ball puzzles even more engaging. While the spider ball can be a little finicky at times, finding a hidden area by accident just by climbing around felt really rewarding. Combining that with the spring ball which allows you to jump while in morph ball makes exploration so much easier. I most definitely did not get jump scared in the spring ball room by this weird turtle boss defending the power up. I definitely would never jump out of my skin seeing this thing stand up to defend itself. I do not get scared at video games. I am. I am a big boy. Still, you know, I gotta give them a little bit of props because I appreciate that they're actually putting some of these power-ups behind challenges and occasionally boss fights. Like, they're not just sitting in the middle of the room. You do have to work for them sometimes. I think even the upgrades to the jump make the whole game feel more massive. You've got the high jump boots from the first game, but now you've got the space jump. Ooh. For the longest time, I didn't understand what the fuck the space jump even was because like, it does the spin animation that you'd get for the screw attack, but it, it didn't do any damage. And then, like a monkey, grabbing a stick for this first time like a tool, I hit the jump button more than once. I think the space jump is one of the best upgrades in any video game. It is just so fun getting to heights and being able to overcome almost any obstacle in the game. But it's not free. You do have to get into a good rhythm and figure out the pattern of when you need to jump again. And when you combine that with the screw attack... Oh god, I'm getting closer to that Metroid fan label. Uh, the endless eternity of waiting for sequels. I appreciate the way they improved on the beam abilities too. Each beam has different strengths, with none being outright better or worse than the others. The ice beam isn't that much different than your basic attack, but being able to freeze enemies is a great utility. The wave beam is more powerful and covers a wide area, making it a pretty safe option for attacking enemies at almost any angle. And the plasma beam is insanely strong, being able to blast most smaller annoyances to bit with just one shot. The downside being that it's a very precise weapon and missing shots leaves you open if you don't hit an enemy. I do appreciate that Samus gets these upgrades, even if I'm a little disappointed that the beam attacks don't hit the various Metroid forms. I understand that they wanted to make each encounter with one of these Metroids really memorable, and, and they are. They really, really are. When you see one of these husks just sitting in your path, it makes you brace yourself because you know that there's one of them skulking about now and you have to get ready for it. And I kept hoping that with each of the different Metroid forms that you encounter, you would get new strategies on how to deal with them. Something other than just using a small malicious worth of ICBMs to just nuke them to death in their face. Again, we're going back to the Kraid method. Most strategies really only revolve around you getting into a position where you can snipe them with as many missiles as you can, or just face tanking damage and force feeding them missiles down their throat. Keep that in mind, we're going to come back to this when we end up talking about the Queen. While the earlier Metroids are easier to take down, usually only, you know, five or so missiles to defeat, the further you get, the more damage spongy they become. By the time you get to the Omega variant, it can take up to like 20 or 30 shots just to take one of them out. It gets real dicey in Area 8 or 9 when there's four Omega variants like in a row and there's no missile restocks anywhere. 
In Metroid 1, there were a lot of endlessly spawning enemies you could farm, and Metroid 2 has them too, but it doesn't feel great when you're low on missiles and standing there, farming a poor little dino friend here, doing nothing but living. He didn't do anything. You made me do this, Metroid. You, you made me do this, Nintendo. You forced me to kill solely so I can continue killing. Eventually, the game brings you to the final zone. When I got down to that final Metroid on the counter, anxiety and anticipation washed over me. There was bound to be a showdown coming up, the moment where Samus could decide the entirety of the Metroid's future. But before you can get too close... When I saw the counter freak out, I admit I was a little bit annoyed. I had assumed that... There was going to be a bunch of different versions of the Metroids from the whole game suddenly appearing to impede my progress. And I wouldn't have been shocked, like, this is the final boss area, I figured she would put up like a little bit of a fight. What I didn't expect, and what changed my entire mind about the game going forward, and even looking back at it, was... What she puts in front of you to defend herself at this point. Maybe I'm looking too deeply into what the game is trying to present, because I would never look too deeply into video game intentions, but seeing the equivalent of Metroid Larva being sent out to defend the Queen changed how I felt about the whole game's objective. Like, I thought there was something off with the atmosphere and the whole monotonous mission, but it really comes together here in the end. The sounds that the Metroids make, even up to the Omega Metroids, never feel like they're trying to be threatening. It's not like enemies making pained noises is new to video games or anything, but it's the conscious effort to make the sounds that the Metroids specifically make that changes how it feels. What the fuck? But it's the conscious effort to make those specific noises that changes how it feels. For 38 other Metroids, they make these pained, almost scared chirps when you damage them. I felt bad in the beginning, but over time I just started to ignore it. Just like when I lost track of how many Metroids I had killed, eventually it just bled into this loop of gameplay. It was just... normal. The sounds that these Metroids made, how many I was killing. Metroid 2's mission isn't all that long. My total playtime for my first playthrough was around a little under 4 hours at most. But it left such a large impression on me. When I finally got back down to one Metroid on the counter, I had to go through with it. I had come too far and I had to see the mission through to the end. So I jumped into the pit, ready to face off with the Queen Metroid for the final time. Ah! Ah, fuck! Oh god. Oh, you know what? Never mind, I changed my mind. This thing deserves to die. Fucking kill it. So. I said that my gameplay for Metroid 2 was a little under 4 hours, and that probably would have been under 3 if I didn't take almost an hour beating the Metroid Queen. That's not a joke. The Metroid Queen gave me more trouble than like most of the bosses in Elden Ring. The Metroid series is now 2 for 2 in terms of bad bosses, and I think that's really concerning. <laughs> In practice, the Metroid Queen doesn't seem like it would be that bad. She only has two different attacks, but it's how they mix with the size of the arena that makes it difficult to get this fight done. Her first attack is spitting up tonsil stones at Samus and pincering in on her. She constantly rotates between hawking loogies at Samus over and over and her second attack. It makes sense why the later sections of SR388 are covered in gunk. I hate that I've made this correlation. Meanwhile, the second attack has the queen showing off just how much of a th oh, I forgot I wrote this into the script. Oh god. Meanwhile, the second attack has the queen showing off just how much of a throat goat she really is. You could fit an entire subway train in there. She'll shoot out her head twice, following Samus's position as best as she can. You can usually bait this out with a jump and follow it up with a missile, and that's pretty much it. She spit, she lunge, rinse, and repeat. And you might be saying to yourself, Wow, guard, your skill issue is showing again. How did you take this long to beat one boss? And to that I say, ouch, words have meaning and I have feelings. And then I would say, sit down and shut. Just, just shut. Because the Metroid Queen is an extremely obnoxious and tanky boss fight, requiring about, I don't know, a hundred missiles or so from what I could guess. And... If you didn't know any other methods like I didn't, you would just be stuck constantly firing missiles at her as best you can through her pattern. So I just kept standing on the wall, jumping up and down, up and down, using the screw attack to destroy the throat stones and defend myself against her head lunge. 
And usually, in each rotation, I was able to slip in around two missiles or so at the most. Over time, the rotation starts to change with her head lunging faster and faster. That means you get less chances to shoot a missile when you're trying to avoid her. It becomes so fast that you can barely slip in one missile per rotation. Sometimes the rotation is just fast enough that your missile will end up hitting the mouth mounds and wasting your resources. In complete fairness to the Queen Metroid, I did find alternate ways of damaging her that I thought was neat. If you can time it right, your missile will cause the queen's head to freeze. Big emphasis on if, it was hard to do this consistently. Then, if you roll into a morph ball, you can climb into her mouth and slide down the water slide of her throat. While you will take damage on her stomach, you can plant a bunch of bombs and do a ton of damage. Using this method was the only way I was able to beat the Metroid Queen. The, the jumping two missile strat was driving me fucking insane. My first couple attempts against her forced me to reset because I kept running out of missiles. There's even a little tube that the developers put into this boss fight room because they knew you might run out of missiles. And it's like, at that point, it might be time to just reevaluate what the boss fight is doing because it is really fucking annoying. After a war of attrition and enough missiles to level a small city, Samus stands victorious. Passing by the Queen Metroid's corpse, she finds a small egg that was being guarded to the very end by the Queen. And as it hatches, it latches onto Samus, following her all the way back to her ship at the very beginning of the game. A bittersweet, but maybe hopeful ending that you thankfully didn't destroy the entirety of the Metroid species. Metroid 2, while not all that different, refines the exploration and combat in a way that I really enjoyed. Aside from still having to look up references, I feel like most of the actual level design of the areas made up for any confusion I had in getting from place to place. The anxiety and loneliness created by the design of SR388 made each encounter with the Metroids more impactful each time that they appeared. Would I play Metroid 2 again? Yeah, I, I think I would. I'm not playing like Samus Returns or AM2R right now because I don't want to taint my perception of it like I did with Metroid 1. But if I were going to sit down and say, you know what? I'm going to play Metroid 2. I don't think I would really have that bad of a time. But now, with the final Metroid in captivity, Samus can go about her days finding easier bounties to take. She doesn't have to worry about the threat of the Metroids and the galaxy can finally be at peace. I mean, it's not like there's about to be some sort of super threat to the galaxy or anything like that, right? If this chaos from Sonic Adventure looking motherfucker wasn't a Super Metroid, I don't want to know what is. If you've kept up with the I've Never videos that I've put out, you've probably noticed a little pattern between them. It's something I noticed too when going back through them and working on this video. Usually on each one, there's one game that I really didn't click with, one or two that I had enjoyed but had criticisms of, all culminating with the final game being my favorite in the bunch. For Metroid, I wouldn't say that there's been one that I've really hated or disliked all that much. Metroid 1 was rudimentary in how little direction it gave to the player, but it was still a great time to play. Metroid 2 was a more refined version of the first game, if still frustrating at times when trying to lead the player around SR388. So at this point, if I'm keeping with the pattern, it would mean that there was one of these that really wouldn't click with me, right? Well, I'm here to give the spicy gamer takes that no one else will. Give an opinion as someone who's never played these games for the first time. And you're going to want to come in real close for this. No, no, don't be shy. Come here. You're going to want to be in rib shanking range when I tell you this. Super Metroid, this, this game right here? This game is pretty fucking... Amazing. I know, I know, I'm saying what everyone else thinks, but no one else is feeling brave enough to say. But I can't lie on these videos. If Even if I have to ostracize myself from the gaming community at large, I can't lie to you all. Okay, now you can stab me. I realize I've made this joke run on just a little too long. Super Metroid has been an awakening for me, reaffirming what I found so fun about the Metroidvania type games that I've played. There is a perfect loop of character growth and exploration that few other games can replicate. And if anything, this game has made me want to rush the I've Never video on the earlier Castlevania games so I can get to the Symphony of the Night era. 
Hey, hi, uh, again, for anyone new here, um, if there's any sort of iconic video game that came out before the PS2 area, there is like a 90% chance that I have never played it. Oh shit, that's why he calls them that. When I played the little bit of Zero Mission for this video, I had to do everything in my power not to get spoiled on it. I knew that a lot of the systems and quality of life upgrades there likely originated here. The idea of finding map stations, the various power-ups and combat encounters you'd find in the world, even just the way that Samus herself controls, it's all easily traced back to Super. And what I think is fascinating, much like when I did my research into the early Zelda games, is, again, how quickly Nintendo developed the formula. In each of the series I've done for these videos, Nintendo somehow hit the nail right on the head when it comes to the games they want these franchise to become. But unlike Zelda and even Mario to a lesser degree, something different happened with the Metroid series. When I mentioned that the Metroid series was more niche, I wasn't aware just how few games there were. In comparison to the dozens upon dozens of side games, spin-offs, extra games, even remakes, Samus' missions are woefully dwarfed by the plumber and to a lesser degree, our favorite little twink. Now, I'm not saying that the amount of games is equal to the quality of them all. You can find a list of Mario and Zelda games, and there's more than a handful of stinkers in there. But what I mean is that, with how few Metroid games there are, even in compared to the other two, it is shocking how much quality there is. It's a shame that Metroid feels so niche because I feel like there's a vibe that most of Nintendo's backlog can't reach. Some of the Zelda games get close, but there's a level of seriousness that you can't match, even in the few games that I've played. Maybe the longer I take to make this video, the quicker Metroid Prime will come out. Oh shit, but what if I put the video out faster and a new interest in Prime 4 starts? Who the fuck am I kidding? Prime 4 is just a collective brain aneurysm at this point. I can't overstate how much I love the presentation of Super Metroid as a whole, leaning into that more oppressive atmosphere started in Metroid 2. The dark, cool colors of the laboratory, the low, droning, mechanical sound of the title music in the background, it's extremely effective at setting the tone right out the gate. I appreciate having this little recap of the series explaining the events of Metroid 1 and 2 for people who might not have played them. Considering 1 was on the NES and 2 was on the Game Boy, there's a high likelihood people might not have had one system or the other. I can think of another famous franchise known for jumping around different consoles with one long interconnected story that could benefit from something like this. Sorry, I was just getting flashbacks to my previous video about dual hearts, wink. I know I keep gushing about the NES games in these series, but there's a reason for that. It's not that the NES games were ever bad, it's just that the developers knew how to wring as much quality out of the SNES and refine what each of these series were good at. Metroid 1 and 2 have extremely great atmosphere and do a great job at putting you into that lonely, overwhelming odds atmosphere. But a lot of the more fantastical and alien elements fall by the wayside due to the color choice or the overall sprite palette or even just the music. Ah yes, the bubble zone. I can definitely tell that I'm on an alien world now. <clears throat> Fuck. Ah yes, the bubble zone. I can definitely tell that I'm on an alien world now. Why I keep I can my voice cracked twice now. Ah yes, the bubble zone. I can definitely tell that I'm on an alien world now. The way Metroid looks and uses the upgrades between systems is phenomenal. Even just the start of the game, starting out on the space station after a distress signal, only to find it completely dead and desolate. Seeing the bodies of the scientists around the shattered containment tube of the Metroid from the starting screen is a powerful visual. Capping it off with a boss fight against Ridley and an escape sequence, Super Metroid's start is extremely memorable. A self-contained sequence to understand the basics of movement, combat, and exploration, something that I thought Link to the Past did just as brilliantly. But while Link to the Past might feel like the more sprawling adventure game, Super Metroid somehow feels like the larger world overall. In comparison to 1 and 2, I feel like Super is a more linear game, and I know that term kind of has a really stinky reputation these days, but I don't mean it in a bad way. It doesn't just railroad you through the game with no deviation. It gives you like the right and wrong ways to go down all the time, all while dangling hidden routes in front of you the whole time. As you grow and gain abilities, your options through older zones become more open. While the zones themselves are massive, it's pretty good about showing you what the direct path through the world is. Your options will be pretty small the first time you go into a zone, but eventually they'll open up as you gain more and more abilities. 
While the lack of direction added to the confusing and lonely nature of Metroid 1 and 2, I can't say that I'm too upset about having a map to cross-reference. But the more that I've thought about it when writing this script, the more I've realized that I didn't use the map except for when I was cleaning up areas for secrets afterwards. The level design on Planet Zebes, Zebes, Zebes. The level design for Planet Zebes is top-notch to the point where I barely felt like I needed the map for regular progression. It's kind of funny, the first time I recognized the level layout for Metroid 1 directly made me pause. That big tunnel straight out of Dr. Mario leading down to the depths where Mother Brain used to hide, even down to the detail of like the broken fishbowl and a similar layout to where you get the morph ball in the first game. I think it's just really clever how they kept these layouts, adding to the idea that yes, this is a planet that was left just how you remembered it. I most certainly did not get jump scared by the Chozo constructs that appear when you go back upstairs. Nope, most definitely didn't get a chill going up my spine when I saw this one fucking climbing over my head when I opened the door. That's something that Super Metroid does fantastically. Something it does often enough to mention, but not so much that it overstays its welcome. It is very good about surprising the player, like the random Chozo constructs I mentioned, or this random boss fight that you get after taking an item off of the pedestal. It's a really sudden moment that catches you off guard as the door shuts behind you and goes gray, only for the construct's pieces to slowly break off as it stands. The way that they animated this construct moving in an almost uncanny way is perfect for how terrifying it feels. The number of times I'd walk into a room, thumb up my ass thinking I was exploring only to find a boss fight happened more times than I'd care to admit. Probably around half of the boss fights caught me by surprise because of the way that the world threads around itself. The design starts to fade away as you get lost in the, the natural winding caverns of Brinstar or Norfair. At least, until you get too comfortable only to have a giant man-eating plant drop down or fucking ghosts show up. Side note, when I got to the wrecked ship, very fun section by the way, I was completely thrown off by the sudden appearance of otherworldly specters. I really shouldn't be surprised, but everything felt so grounded in that scientific sort of way. I did not expect the screaming amalgamation of damned souls to be in the middle of this crashed ship. Is it great for world building and environmental storytelling? Oh, absolutely. But that's not going to unshit my pants from when I saw this thing screaming at me when I walked in. The fuck was I even talking about? Oh, boss fights. Um, the way that other games do boss fights usually feels pretty obvious. You can see ahead where there's a giant arena or just like a single enemy just standing there. Menacingly. But because of the way that Super Metroid is designed, a lot of rooms can just become life or death brawls out of nowhere. Even if some of these boss fights are... a little shit? I mean, if I had to give one criticism to Super Metroid, it's still that some of the bosses are very hit or miss. Now, should I get the crucifix out now, or do you want to wait until the end of the video? For me, what makes a good boss fight is telegraphed enemy attacks versus the opportunity to fight back. For a boss fight like the Metroid Queen in the second game, the attacks are extremely well telegraphed and relatively easy to dodge. The issue with the fight comes in the slowly closing window of your time to attack as you do more damage. In that instance, the balance is swayed on the too much telegraph, not enough time side. Meanwhile, Mother Brain swings on the opposite side too much. You have plenty of time to attack the tubes and Mother Brain herself, in theory. The problem comes is there's so many projectiles flying your way. While you can see where they're coming from, it's a lot to keep track of while also trying to hit a somewhat precise target. Too much time to attack while not having enough telegraph on the boss's cycles. And while the bosses in Super tend to find a good balance between mechanics and damage phases, there are a few that cause some problems. The Ghostbuster reject here in the crashed ship has a lot of really good and bad elements. Most of it comes down to how he spawns these extra little fire boys and eventually his big spicy ring. It comes out so fast and spins so quickly that it's hard to make a proper gap to avoid the attack. Or this big fucking fish boss, the amount of shit he shoots at you combined with how fast he moves in his different phases makes it a nightmare. I don't want to constantly fight with the weapon swapping just to avoid his fish jism. I don't- <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. I don't want to constantly fight with the weapon swapping just to avoid his fish jism. I just want to blast his belly with a super missile. Why do the bosses have to fight back? It gets to the point where like, in between his fucking cum phases, you have like a single digit frame window to actually land a missile in. It reminded me of the worst parts of the Queen Metroid fight where it became almost impossible to get one missile in every rotation. 
Man, if only there was an alternative kill method that was probably the intended method by the devs that I only found out about after making the video. Wouldn't that just be so funny? Wouldn't that be fucking hilarious that I wasted all of my health and resources killing this boss in an extremely slow and deadly way? I'm laughing for real! Most of my gripes with the boss fights barely ever come down to the controls. If I got hit with an attack or I missed a missile, I did genuinely feel like it was my fault. Usually. That comes down to the fact that Samus, even more than the previous game, feels almost perfect to control. Her speed is fast enough to get around quickly, and her jump is tight enough that I never felt like I was afraid of missing platforms. I loved running around in 1 and 2. I couldn't get enough of playing Super Metroid. I know they really didn't change a whole lot when it comes to the playstyles between games, but something about how they fine-tune everything just hits. And all the upgrades make the fun exploration feel that much more engaging and rewarding. The usual suspects from the previous games are back again. We got, uh, got your high jumps, we got uh, your space jumps, we even got your screw attacks. You want a good jump, you come down to Metroid's Moon Jump Emporium. You got all your jumps for your Metroid mashing needs. But it's the new abilities that really show the possibilities of what Metroid could become in the future. The grapple beam, while a little bit finicky, is really fun and great for precision platforming. When you figure out that letting go of the grapple button is how you launch forward, you can live your greatest Tarzan dreams. Though of course the biggest upgrade to traversal is the speed booster and all the shine sparking goodness that it brings to the table. If you want tight timing and split second reaction platforming, Super has the perfect mechanic. While I didn't find every single secret of the game and I didn't do a lot of the shine sparking puzzles, the few that I did were amazing to pull off. The one in the underwater tunnel where you go between the rooms and thread the needle? Mwah, divine. Absolutely everything in Super Metroid makes you feel like a force of nature. While it starts you out at square one again, missing a large majority of your power-ups from the previous game, the feeling of how powerful you are at the start versus how powerful you become is impossible to beat. Between the mixing and matching of the beams you can do and the souped up bombs and missiles, it feels so good. Really appreciated by the way, uh, being able to keep the ice the entire game, nice touch. By the time you get to the end of the game with all of your powers, there won't be many enemies that can stand in your way. Running through a hallway of obstacles that used to bother you only to space jump with your screw attack clearing a path through everything, better than sex. I appreciated that they let you turn off the various abilities on your suit one by one if you wanted to. Did I ever use it? No. I liked being a super soldier that just turned everything into viscera in her path. But I could see where it could be useful turning off abilities that might be causing you problems. Or you could mix and match the different beams if you liked a certain combination better. Personally, I was perfectly happy just freezing enemies in place and nuking them down with my plasma wave beam. Genuinely, I was so happy when I realized that the beams didn't completely overwrite each other. When I got the spacer and it just kept freezing enemies while doing its cool attack. You know, I'm happy calling this like the greatest game of all existence if you are. Unfortunately, there are some issues I have with the sheer amount of upgrades and how you toggle through them. Unless I've completely missed something, to swap between all the different missiles, bombs, and upgrades you have at the top of the screen, you have to hit select. But instead of being able to just select which one you want, you have to go through the whole list to get to the right one. For example, say you're on the super missile and you want to get back to the regular missile, you would have to hit select five times to get back to the missile, assuming you've found all the power-ups. And in most instances, this wouldn't be a problem, but in places like boss fights or corridors with a lot of enemies, swapping items becomes a manic mashing of select just to get back to the item that you want. Early on, it's not so bad just swapping between missiles, then missiles and super missiles, but by the end of the game, when you've gotten the grapple beam and the x-ray scope, it becomes cumbersome to just get back to what you might need. And I understand that this is about to be a very niche complaint, but the locked doors, the ones that require the super missile and the super bombs, the colors are so close to each other that my fucked up broken colorblind eyes couldn't tell the difference more than a few times. I wasted more bombs and super missiles than I care to count. Is this a problem that most people are gonna have when they play through the first time? No, they'll probably figure out the two colors right away. And again, after a certain point, you have so much arsenal built up that losing one or two bombs isn't really going to kill you too much. But it still felt pretty bad every time I'd get to a super bomb or super missile door, stand there, squint a few times, and even then have to roll a 50-50 just to see if I'd get it right. How dare Nintendo not take into account my broken eyes 30 years ago? 
I guess one of my last real criticisms about Super is that the end of the game feels a little all over the place. None of it is bad, but I feel like it starts to rely on a lot of the same gimmicks that Metroid 1 did where it purposely obfuscate traps or paths forward. Like, finding this hidden path in Ridley's base made me feel like a genius only to find out it was the path to Ridley. The path here and the boss are extremely cool. Super Metroid has amazing set pieces that stuck with me, but I had gotten used to finding hidden paths that rewarded optional content only to be weirdly disappointed when I stumbled on the main path ahead. Does that make any sense at all? Looking back at the end of the game, specifically about like Ridley and Mother Brain's boss area, I felt like I was getting some of that tedious design back from Metroid 1. When I saw these fucking tubes again in Mother Brain's base, I let out an audible groan. I thought I was about to get another rehash of the Metroid 1 final boss. I do not like Metroid 1 Mother Brain. I think it's the worst part of the game. So when I saw this, I thought I was about to give it a 3 for 3 in bad bosses for Metroid games. Turns out, I was thankfully very, very, very wrong. There's an amazing fake out once you get to the Mother Brain that caught me completely off guard. There's a point when you're making your way through her lair, getting closer and closer to your showdown with that mushy mommy. As you walk in, there's enemies of different varieties just standing there. I thought maybe they would activate if you get too close, so I shot a beam preemptively to get the first hit. Only for them to just crumble to dust before my eyes. Each enemy you walk by falls into grains of sand and it's really haunting. Nothing in the game had been like this so far, besides the literal fucking ghosts. So introducing such a horrific sight put me on guard. And then from off screen, a massive Metroid flies in, angry and hungry, ready to fight. You put up as good of a fight as you can, but it easily overpowers you, draining you of your energy tank by tank. This is the second time Samus has been sucked to death in Mother Brain's home by my count. But the Metroid, it, it stops and starts to float off. And it dawns on you as you see it react to Samus. This is the Metroid from Metroid 2, the one that you saved at the very end. You can find its containment like after Redley's boss fight just sitting there shattered. This thing has been free and hungry for a long time. It's a really subtle touch connecting this mission back to a previous story and adding a lot of emotion to a game that really doesn't have much to begin with. Samus is an extremely stoic character with maybe a collective one paragraph of dialogue in three games, and it's moments like this that really build out the world better. It sets the stakes very high because now you know the last Metroid is safe, but it, now it's also a danger to you. It's ravenous, and it's likely looking for more food. And you just happen to look like it. You make your way to the tube room through a bunch of other, I assume, either synthetic Metroids or forcefully bred ones. God, I hope it's not the latter. The boss starts out as an almost one-to-one -one recreation of Metroid 1, destroying tubes on the way up to Mother Brain's big tank. A few dozen missiles and super missiles later, she falls flat onto the ground like a dead fish. Mission accomplished. Or, uh, or not, getting back up onto a new Godzilla form and rearing her head back. This form is fucking imposing, even if I knew this was the final boss thanks to speedruns. Seeing her get up after a long moment, facing off against you in a new horrific body horror form is just, it's sick. Hey, to all like the big Metroid lore heads out there, is Mother Brain just hanging out on the Queen Metroid's body? Because if so, that is so fucked up and cool that it makes Mother Brain even more evil in retrospect. I I love the idea because I would never forget a throat goat like that. Like it has to be, right? Is she just pulling like a part three Dio on the Metroid Queen's body? Like, is that what's going on? I am about to get a, a Discord message from a friend who knows that I haven't watched part three of JoJo, oh God. In comparison to all the other boss fights, Mother Brain isn't really that hard. It's not bad either. I enjoy it overall because if you slip up for even a second, you get fucked up hard. The attacks are telegraphed well, but still feel a little too easy to avoid. And yet, and yet, even as you plink away at her head with your missiles and your super missiles, there's that constant air of do or die. The room you're in is small, and with most of Mother Brain's new dumpy taking up half the room, the best strategy I found was staying close to the other wall and keeping a close aim on her head, taking shots every single chance you get. With enough determination and consistent shots, she'll eventually switch to phase two. Samus! Samus, look out! You're about to get hit with the full concentrated power of gay! Samus, no!
But when all seems lost and Samus keels over after that massive brain blast from Mother Brain, the baby Metroid comes in and starts giving her the massive suck on that gray matter. Wait. Wait, wait, no! Metroid! Metroid, you're too young for that! That's too much gay for you, Metroid, no! As the Mother Brain stumbles back and recovers, the now Ultra Metroid floats over to Samus and starts trying to heal her, giving her the concentrated power of Tumblr fanfics and all sorts of hyperfixations. She restores Samus to full health. And honestly, it's a really nice narrative loop with the Metroid we saved in Metroid 2 now saving us in return. Which makes the heart punch of watching Mother Brain beat the shit out of the baby as it continues to protect Samus more impactful. Attack after attack, watching the inside of the Metroid's body change colors even as it starts to lift off and escape, only for the music to completely cut with the corpse of the Metroid falling into the background. The adrenaline and the anger you fear, the sheer urge to kill that flowed through my veins made the second half of this fight even sweeter. With your blaster charged with the full might of the LGBTQ, you annihilate Mother Brain with a massively overpowered beam. Shot after shot, causing Mother Brain to recoil and scream. Man, does it feel so good. When you go through the whole game with this slow, incremental growth in power, dealing with ammunition reserves and increasingly difficult enemies, it feels so good to have this sudden power spike. You feel like you're the boss of the game, and previous enemies that were really difficult to kill are just dead in one shot. It's beautiful. The escape sequence feels like a proper threat this time around. Metroid 1 had an artificial urgency with its really generous timer, and Metroid 2 was just kind of a story moment. But here it's a real race. You have to run from the very bottom of the planet to the very top back to your ship, and the timer is pretty tight if you don't know where you're going. I definitely didn't feel like I was gonna fucking throw up with how much screen shake there was here. Nope. To feel fine. And in case you're wondering, yes, I did go back and save the animals. No, that wasn't a second attempt because I failed the first time. You know, it's funny, when looking up the various planet names for the script, I found a wiki page that specifically details the planets that Samus has completely destroyed either directly or indirectly through the series. I just think it's funny that it's common enough to have a wiki page, honestly. To me, Super Metroid rivals the quality of Link to the Past or even Super Mario World, shining examples of what their franchises would be known for and would iterate upon for years. The enjoyment I got out of hunting down secrets, exploring the depths of Planet ZBs, and how powerful you feel by the end of the game was hard to put down. While in previous videos like this, I usually split my playtimes into one or two hour chunks so I didn't burn out. But here, I did multiple three hour plus sessions of Super because I just wanted to keep playing. And even then I was debating if I was going to try and squeeze in Metroid Fusion as an extra part of this video. As you can see by the video length and thumbnail, I decided against that, but you can be sure I'm going to circle back to Metroid really soon. As much as I love the early Zelda games, I can for sure say without a doubt I am a fan of Metroid now, with no contest. But before I start going on and on about how much I loved all three of these games, let's circle back to the start of our mission and start the debriefing. Um, you also have five seconds to escape Planet Zebus. Good luck! Space is a place of infinite possibilities and countless questions with so few answers. And while you may not be able to clap the cheeks of your favorite Asari waifu in real life, games have done a fantastic job of portraying any number of interpretations of what's out there. Alien life that we couldn't possibly understand, worlds that only exist in our most vibrant imaginations. And at the forefront, Metroid has created worlds and stories that continue to inspire dozens. While many of the designs in Metroid have hints of H.R. Geiger and the Alien films, Nintendo has created a whole world of creative potential. From the lore of the Chozos, the Galactic Federation, to the Metroids, and even Samus herself. That feeling of being a super powerful bounty hunter in power armor, a solo force to be reckoned with, is a concept that continues even to this day. 
Doom Guy, Master Chief, Ultra Kill Robot, all of these characters have something in common. That's not to say that they're stealing from Samus or anything like that, but they all put you into the boots of really powerful protagonists. Characters that are strong in their own right, but placed into worlds that would tear them apart if they hesitated for even a second. For Samus, the Metroid games would redefine character growth and power creep. Along with the later Castlevania games, the signature style of starting a character off at a weaker state and letting them grow over time, the incremental creeping of this insane power that the character has, would just create an entire subgenre of games. And having gone through and finally explored the origin of Metroid, I can see why that entire subgenre exploded in the first place. Done correctly, a Metroidvania-type game can set up the perfect hero's journey and tell stories of growth and struggle. It still requires meticulous, clever design and fun, engaging abilities for the player to learn. But when it's done right, when it blends worlds and gameplay in masterful ways like Metroid, you can create incredibly special experiences that many games have a hard time replicating. I've mentioned them before, but games like Dust and Elysian Tale or the Ori series stick with me because of this combination. You get attached to the locations you journey through, you experience what the world is going through by naturally exploring and playing. That moment of walking into the space station in Super and seeing the dead scientists on the ground was haunting and powerful. I really regret not playing these games sooner. And not just in like, oh, I didn't play them in my childhood. I mean, I wish I would have played these games in general sooner. Metroid is my fucking jam, and it just inspires me to try and do more with this series sooner. Unfortunately, that means I am now a Metroid fan, and I have to get used to the idea of getting one sequel every decade. I'm still not letting myself play F-099. I'm not, I'm not ready for that kind of torture just yet. I'm already a Sly Cooper fan, man. I, I can't do it again with another series. As someone who grew up largely on Sega and Sony games, it's been amazing to play some of the biggest classics of Nintendo. I've missed out on so many genre and industry-defining games, and I think that's always what's going to inspire me to make these. Finding series that I've neglected for years and saying with my whole entire chest that yes, I am a fan. Now maybe I should like spread out when I do these Metroid game videos. There's like 15 total games. I'm sure I could ration them out over the next few years if I really need to. And, you know, at the end of the day, if I get really desperate, I can always pick up Federation Force. God, I'm so sorry, Metroid fans. But thank you all so, so much for watching this. I had a lot of fun making this, and I was really surprised how much I loved Metroid. I hope that came through in the video through all the different jokes and criticisms. Um, if you liked what you saw, please hit the subscribe button. We're almost at 1,000. I'd love to hit that by the end of the year. Thank you all so much, regardless, for just watching. I appreciate it a ton. Um, if you want to see more of me, for some reason... Um, the last video I did on Dual Hearts is right here. Really good video. I guarantee you've never heard of the game before, but you really should. It's a great game. And if you want to see more videos like this specifically, here's the full playlist for the I've Never series. I like to do these videos and I like to deep dive into older games I've never played. So expect more of these pretty soon. Um, that's about it. Have a good day. Bye bye I don't know how to finish these later.